I think the best way to kind of like kind of kick things off is kind of want people to kind of uh, introduce themselves, um, just so we can get a really uh, great picture. We're gonna start off um, with one of a lot of the panelists up here, like are really great friends of mine, and I'm really appreciative that they really came out and um, supported me and stuff like that. So we're gonna start with uh, Sandy Lau. If you don't necessarily know him personally, you've in, you've been entertained by by an artist or personality on television that he represents and he gets busy so hey everyone uh, my name is Sandy Lal I'm an entertainment attorney and a talent manager hey everyone my name is Autumn M I'm a music blogger and a cultural blogger hi my name is Alec Bemis I uh, run a record label uh, that I started with a band called The National who do well and have managed a bunch of artists uh, Briefly, this band Dirty Projectors, Chick Chick Chick, Alexi Murdoch, some things. How's everybody doing? My name is Lavelle James. Um, I'm a singer, songwriter, audio engineer, producer, uh, backgrounds in TV and film, uh, scoring, whatnot. Uh, I'm Cedric Guy. I'm a producer, songwriter, um, publisher, and production company owner. My name is Spud Brooklyn. I'm an engineer, songwriter, uh, also run a nonprofit where we use music as an alternative approach to decision making, and I'm a talent scout uh, for shipping towards or shopping artists towards artists in uh, major or independent labels. How's everyone doing? My name is Corey Chorus. I'm a singer, songwriter, vocal producer, and executive producer. I work on various products and artists in the marketplace, and um, yeah, we just have fun inspiring people through song. Hi, my name is Mike Cameron. I own um, Water Music Publishing. Hi, my name is Sugary, and I'm an artist developer as well as an event curator. I've worked with artists like John Baptiste, Grace Weber, Zia V, Victoria Canal, and currently Running Lights. So to um, kind of start this thing off, um, Connor and Kiana had two questions that they kind of wanted to pose to the panel. You know, and you can start off if you feel like this fits you. Um, Connor asked was one of the things he wanted is like, how do artists starting out Reaching um, reach people that aren't already their friends, how they connect with new friend, um, new fans, and new people instead of just asking friends to bring friends to your shows, or share their stuff with your friends. So I thought maybe we can start with Autumn. Um, hey y'all. So one thing that I noticed because I blogged with um, Funk Flex, DJ Enough, and other blog sites as well as like Afropunk and everything. So when working with artists, a lot of them. You know, they don't know their demographics, so I think the best thing about it is like understanding your demographic, understanding your audience, because it's much more than just your friends and family. So understanding um, your analytics in the back end of it. So, you know, we have those insights in our data and everything, and being in marketing, you see exactly which region is playing your music. And um, like this artist here, she was saying how the UK, so understanding like your different audience base each out and then reaching out to them and reaching out to different promoters and those, and also pushing out content towards those DJs in those local areas is one great thing that I say. Um, my suggestion is to connect with Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would say that a lot of this has to do with the data, as uh, Sandy has said, but uh, beyond that, even pairing it with understanding who your audience is, who do you want your audience to be, really understanding what your brand is. You have to really understand who you are before you're going to go ahead and play to any and everyone. You're not going to be able to please everybody, so you're going to need to find your audience and where it is, and then using that data and enhancing that, you're actually going to be able to find something that's going to be more effective in terms of growing your audience. To tag along with that, I think one of the things um, while I'm working in the studio, a lot of artists have a problem with is not creating their own experience. Um, they'll make a good record, and the record will be good, and then it'll get stuck being a good record rather than being an artist. And I think they'll just post, post. You have to actually be the artist continuously and live in that experience. And those who can relate, instead of traveling towards or gearing records towards the commonality of things or making similar records, um, once you actually live into your music or your existence, people will gravitate to that, that get it. So focus on those who get it first, everybody else will follow. Um, I think you have to be speaking to a community of some sort and you have to figure out how to reach that community and probably it's gonna be a subculture and not the world at large. 
uh, and the way you actually connect with that community probably is not going to be just finding one person at a time, but finding other artists that you connect with and are already in those communities, and then you kind of cross your fingers and grow from there. But uh, I think the day of kind of going right for the mainstream is sort of long gone, and I think if you are going for that world, you literally have to have a gimmick like Lil Nas X and really cross your fingers. And I'm a fan of that, like I like that song. I doubt he has much more in him than that as recorded music goes, but uh, the attention, they call it the attention economy now with sort of the digital platforms, and essentially, unless you're willing to go completely broad, you are not going to talk to everyone. So you have to figure out how to talk to a smaller segment of everyone. One other thing is just understanding your analytics. I feel like a lot of artists that, that I work with, they don't take advantage of the fact that they have uh, numbers that they can like look at and, and analyze. They, uh, the people will tell you who to perform to, who to grasp onto. So you gotta just read your analytics, understand that, and focus on them, you know? I think Laval makes a, a great point because if you use Instagram, you use Facebook, if you have a business page, it tells you whether if you're, especially if you're promoting posts and stuff like that, who your demographic is, like male, female, what part of the world. You can target also places to go. I've taken songs to go, well, I think this song's great. Let me just target cities that I know and friends in South Africa and see how this works. And if it comes back great, then you know that's the place for you. So I think that it's, there's reading and study that comes with being an artist. So the next, I'm going to go on to the next question. Uh, can I ask, what do you think is the short-term future of streaming? Like, what do you see happening in the next year or so? So maybe we start off with Mike. Did you want to, hold on, oh, do you want, did you get skipped? Yeah, 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 yeah. I got skipped, but it's oh, oh, I'll just talk more on the next one, it's cool. Oh, uh, no, 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 you want me to answer it? Yeah. Oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, so yeah, I, th I think it's an interesting question because I, I, judging by the answers, um, it, I think it depends on the level of the artist and it's a little bit of an echo, but I think it's a, the level of the artist. Obviously, you know, um, I'm just gonna go ahead and talk about a brand new independent artist because obviously they probably wouldn't have any analytics, right? If you are at a place where you have analytics that matter, then, then you know, you're in a much better place. But for someone just like brand new starting out, I think that, um, you know, uh, just don't be lazy, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, it's an incredible time right now where new artists have so many tools available to them that were never available, and they can break through in, in, in a million different ways. You know, you've got Instagram, you've got Facebook, you've got Twitter, you've got SoundCloud, you've got YouTube, um, Audio Mac. I mean, the list goes on and on and on, and... and you know, if, if if the artist is putting together the, the look and the and the art the right way, um, you know, it it's gonna take work, right? But but you gotta just start pushing it out and you know, it's it's a huge discoverability market right now, right? It's like the best time. That's what people want. They wanna discover new talent. So, um, you know, networking and, and, and just pushing your stuff upon people and so on and so forth. Like, people are a lot more receptive than, than you, you think they are. Um, I would just say something that probably relates to all of you. I mean, you're listening to music because you want to feel something. Uh, a mentor, a distant mentor of mine, uh, Chef Gordon, had a very wonderful thing to say regarding anything regarding music or anything regarding arts and culture. The kiss of death ends up being indifference. You're not listening to music just to feel nothing. You're really there to feel something. So really digging deep and trying to find out who actually really resonates with you ends up being uniquely important. Because if you don't, I mean, you can analyze all the analytics and stuff that, that adds a, a contributing factor, but you need to form that overall thing in terms of who really is listening to you. And it's okay that nobody, that not the whole world listens to you. It's not gonna work that way, especially now where everybody's ADD in this attention economy. You wanna get those that are gonna focus on you and ride with you all the way to the end, so. See, I have a little different, uh, my philosophy is similar to Sandy's. I think that most people should look at their favorite artists, okay, and see how much some of these artists are making and then determine your worth. You understand? Because mo most of the acts that I come across, 
they don't work eight hours on their career. They, they work an hour here, maybe, and then expect to be discovered. If you put, this, if you put the, the work and the effort into your career, what you think you're worth, it's unlimited. You see what I'm saying? If, if, you, if you think that you're worth $10 million, how do you work? You see what I'm saying? How, how, how do you really expect to get there? Because my favorite artist, I love Drake. From Drake came out, he has not stopped. There's not been a year that you don't hear a Drake record since he's come out. How can any artist in here expect to get to that level and do less? Yeah, that's, that's my point. I think that's the best, the best, the best point. I think, yes, I am, um, you know, as a songwriter and a publisher, yes, the analytics are very important for me, but I think on a, just a ground level, I think it's very important to connect with people. It's, it's important to connect with the songs. Of course, I feel like if you can, if you can hit somebody in their soul, they're going to buy. Just like, you know, if you hit somebody in the soul with their, you know, when you go to a car dealership, you know, you hit somebody in their in they soul, they fall in love with the car, they're going to they're gonna purchase. So I think if you create a product that people love and they want and they can, they can connect their heart to it and they can, you know, you can, I think you can sell a little bit of anything. I think streaming is on the rise. Um, but I, again, I think if, if you have a, a great song and a great product, people will buy. So um, let's kind of dig a little deeper into this. So um, I kind of want to start off, because I think we covered a lot of different things. So I think we can start a really good place is, why is it impor so important to own your own intellectual property? Anybody wants to tackle that? <laughs> I, I mean, why not? I mean, <laughs> at, at the end of it, you want to reap the benefits of your work. Um, I think sometimes we get lost in the analytics, uh, the likes, the follows, and it boils down to music. And you are your biggest business, if you take it that serious. You are the product, and um, you want to reap the gains of that. And I think once you own your own, you have a different respect for it and an understanding for your worth, kind of like the brother was saying, knowing your worth. So the importance of that is, the value that you obtain, the value that you have, and the value that you deserve for the work that you put in. So the importance of that, I, I wouldn't see it or wouldn't want it other way of ownership, especially of your work. I mean, I think it's not so much about not owning your work, but don't sell too cheaply. Um, you know, you don't want to do a deal for nothing, but probably at some point you're going to have to give up a percentage of, you know, the revenue. If you have someone very large sort of pushing you hard, um, they probably are going to want ownership. I'm sure, you know, whether it was wise or not, again, to go back to Lil Nas X, who the reason everybody's talking about him, it's hard not to. It's such a weird case, but I'm sure he gave something up to sign to a major label, but if that took him from being big on TikTok to having 500 million streams on the first two songs, the first song he's put out, like that could do something for him. It doesn't necessarily mean you're giving away your whole career or your whole catalog, multi-record deals, like those kinds of things I actually think are happening less um, than they used to um, because there are tools where you can kind of do it yourself until there's something that's worth selling. But again, I don't, I don't think it's about Ownership, not ownership, it's not devaluing what you're selling. Whether it's, if you're getting 50-50 split of profits on something that a larger label is putting out, that can be good. Um, anyway. Um, how many people here remember when the record companies did everything for everybody? Back then, it was like you was at the mercy of the record companies and they owned everything. Now, with the way the music, the digital age is, you can own your own material. You can be your own boss. You can be your own record company, your own publisher, okay? That's what the dichotomy of today is. And, and the thing is that most of these artists, like Michael said, like Sandy said, most of them are lazy. They wait for things to come to them. Nothing's gonna come to you. You gotta make it happen. And if you don't make it happen for yourself, that just shows that you're lazy. So the thing is that you gotta be consistent. 
we gotta write consistent songs, okay? And that's the whole thing in the record company. You are the business. I'm guessing, to piggyback what everyone's saying, it, to be honest, you are your own business. You really are. I've never, I've personally never stopped the whole grind of, I'm where, if you, if you got a session that's happening in the subway, I'm there. You know, like you still have to get up and you got to go out there and get it. If you, if you make $2 million, like you're going to grind so you can get the next 2 million, the next 4 million and build it. But you always have to maintain your, your hunger. I think that's important. It's important, that, you know, my whole thing was I felt like I needed to get up for my career and move to Los Angeles. So I got up and moved to Los Angeles. That's where all the producers were. I felt like f film and TV was there. That's where I needed to, you know, to be. So in going there and moving to Los Angeles, it changed my life. But I love New York, so I'm here in New York as well. So it's important. You got to hustle. This is New York City. It's going to build you. It's going to break you. It's going to mold you. It's going to shine you. But yeah, you gotta hustle. You really do have to hustle. I think, you know, you got Mark Zuckerberg is hustling, but at a different level. You know, but you, you also got, you know, the guy on the train hustling as well. So you still gotta hustle. You gotta hustle. And that's, I think that's the, the root of it all. Yes, you gotta know the numbers and, and everything else, but what's gonna get you the meeting? You gotta hustle. You know, what's gonna get you the fans? You gotta hustle. You know, I think that's important. Um. Hey, so I just want to reiterate that Chance the Rapper is a perfect example of this case of owning your own content and understanding the transparency of what happens between record labels because you do have a split where some of the, most of the time you're not profiting off of your first chart. You know, you see a lot of these producers right now that are in these news stories who have hits with Drake or ASAP Rocky and everything, but they're still living in the projects. So things like that and just like understanding the transparency that we have with social media and then you also have all these music documentary series the TLC series that came out on VH1 was also a perfect example of why we're seeing our favorite artists from the 90s actually having to restart their whole entire brand and coin off of that because they weren't properly paid in those eras when we really didn't understand the whole legality of everything with the music industry. So that's also really important. Um, I'm just gonna add a little something with it regards to, uh, you know, this is an attention economy as everybody's been saying, so I mean, you gotta be going out there and getting attention all the time. I mean, this is that hustle. Everybody here on this panel probably understands it more intimately than anybody that this thing is a hustle game. And you better believe it. If you think that it's something that you're just gonna sit back and you know wait for things to come, manna from heaven, it seriously will not. <laughs> you really gotta be out there. I mean, we did a, there's a there's artist I'm developing right now called Running Lights. Uh, we did their debut show. And uh, everybody told us that we were not going to be able to do a mid-size venue starting right out the gate for their debut show. Uh, we did Gramercy Theater, and we packed the place for the debut show. But for that, we sent out thousands upon thousands of text messages, followed up with emails, did personalized phone calls to everybody to make sure people showed up. And so all the people that were watching and doubting all of a sudden had a different narrative come the returns when the ticket sales came back. And well, hey, black and white and the money shows it, so. What you have to do also, you have to, with all the networks that are out, you have to build a fan base. In building the fan base, you're able to go into record labels and determine pretty much what you want. Because most record labels, they may talk about the music, they like this or they like that. In essence, it's a business. You know, what can you sell? You know, what venues can you pack? You know what I'm saying? How many streams can you get? The people that write the checks are concerned with the return. So what you want to do as an independent artist is take the time and build your fan base. And you have all the tools to do it now. You know, nothing's really changed. You know, back in the day, people would do the chitlin circuit. You know, get your band, get in the van, tour. Same thing. It's just now you have the advantage of social networks. So to go to the, um, the next question, um, how do you think is the best way for a songwriter or producer, especially that's independent, to build their brand? And why is that important now in this digital age that the songwriter and producer actually has to be their own band and brand and build their own brand? Um, 
Y'all okay to tackle this? Okay. So I work with a lot of artists, um, and they send me all of their music. So mind you, I'm listening to all this music, um, but I'm like, so give me your bio. What's, give me a screenshot. When's your album coming out? You know, what's the story behind you? And a lot of them can't even tell me that. So when I am receiving all this, I'm like, you don't have a biography written about you already? You don't have a logo? You don't have a mixtape cover? So how am I supposed to properly promote you if you're not properly promoting yourself? And that's one thing that I really wanna stress is like, branding and marketing goes hand in hand with your craft. You can have a team of people develop it or you can understand it yourself. There's YouTube of how to do graphic design and all that. But um, when you're not properly telling your story, somebody else is gonna narrate your story for you and you should be in control of narrating your own story and understanding your own brand. And a lot of times we live in social media world where um, everyone's like looking on them and that's like the whole, that's the lens of like seeing who you are. So it's really careful. You have to carefully like illustrate who you are as a person. And I respect people like J. Cole as an artist who understands that his personal life is personal and his brand is his brand. So you'll never hear from Cole unless he's dropping a project. You never hear from Kendrick unless he's dropping a project because that's their brand and they understand that. And I think it's really great to just like highlight understanding yourself and understanding that you have to put all these tools in in order for people to understand you as an artist, especially if you're starting out. I deal a lot with um, writers, so it's a little bit more complicated um, based on developing a writer. I think that um, writers should get with artists that are local artists that they feel is getting some traction so that they can get their songs heard, you know, or try to reach out to management companies as well as production companies. You know, a writer doesn't necessarily need the social media as an artist might, okay, but the key to it, it's always gonna be the grind. You know, there's, there's so many avenues, you know, try to get jingles, try to, try to get song, get syncs, you know. There's so many how-to, pages to go to now. You know, there's the music registry. There's, there's so many different places that people can go to to get contacts, you know, or to see who's looking. And I think that that's another thing that people should do is invest in their craft. You know, you, know, you work and you take the money that you make sometimes and reinvest it in yourself, you know, to get some of these directories and things like that, you know? And if all else fail, get a budget and hire Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's important. Hiring Sandy is very important. You have to hire Sandy. Repeat it after me, hire Sandy. Yeah, hire Sandy. No, Sandy's awesome, and it's very important too. As a songwriter, um, in regards to online, and I just call it fame, um, I've realized that, you know, I loved like when um, Brian Michael Cox and Adonis used to have like they used to be jumping on on YouTube and they were like showing their sessions and it was like man I really want to I really want to be in the studio and we didn't understand that that was just them advertising their work and who they were working with and for me I personally do that but I always feel like me writing songs is just waking up in the morning I write a song I write two songs a day and it's, it's just it's I've built that. Um, but I also want to show people that I cook and I want to show people that you know what book I'm reading So it's more so about lifestyle So it's important that you I guess you know just like you were saying it's important that you you figure out what works for you and Post what you want to post for yourself whether it be you advertising your your work um, the songs that you release that you have um, It's all it, again. It all depends on what kind of songwriter you are Again, like Mike said, it's not you don't really need it as a songwriter, um, but it, it does help. It helps advertise your um your business and you know the work that you've done, you know, when major artists or even local artists or independent artists that are just moving, you know, when they, you know, say, Hey, I wrote the song or I, you know, whatever you did to the song. So it works out for you. Just to tag along on that network. Um, for a writer and a producer, one of the biggest things you could do is networking. Um, she mentioned that someone from the UK reached out on, her, on Instagram. Um, social media made the world so much smaller, and there's a high percentage of that that are artists, that are producers, that are songwriters, that are executives, 
that are like Sandy. Um, it's, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's there. And just as much as everyone wants to be heard in that aspect of artistry, there are people who are wanting to help or wanting to network and build together. So I say reach out, um, utilize that. Um, it's not only just for the posting of your presence, but it's also to grab in for your expression. So network, that's one of the biggest things that helped out with me. I'll give you a short story. Um, a few years ago, I reached out to T.I. On, on Instagram. I called him a dickhead. And um, I, I did. I called him a dickhead um, due to the fact that he was getting into so much trouble. And the Trouble Man album was coming out, and he responded. And I'm in my bed, 3 in the morning, with my feet up, talking to T.I. for like a half hour. And he started telling me about B.O.B. And that's an experience that I would not have gotten if it wasn't for Instagram. And I took that one shot. I mean, I call him a dickhead, but it worked. So I say network. You, we have the world in the palm of our hands. Utilize it. Yeah, I mean, I think getting back to the pure, it's actually very much like the experience he's talking about. A lot of people feel like if you're on the internet, you have to do everything. And I actually think that's that's an error. You know, you shouldn't do nothing, but you don't have to be everywhere on all the platforms all the time. But you have to choose at least one where you're doing something. I mean, I remember, I think Frank Ocean, it became like a, a bit of a meme that he made his Instagram public. And I think he had had like two or 300,000 followers before it was public because people knew, you know, there was this account and who's this mysterious guy? Let's chase after him. So that's, you know, an artist who didn't technically need social media. He was big before any of that happened. But on the other side, I have a sort of small producer I work with uh, that's worked a little bit with uh, the sort of animal collective group, this guy, Panda Bear, this uh, kind of big indie thing. One of them actually had a co-write on the last Solange record, so it crosses over into weird lanes. And the producer himself has a social media presence because one of his biggest sources of work the last couple of years has been China. Like random bands from China flying him in, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, make a record in a week, done. And none of those people would have found him if he didn't have some kind of Instagram presence where it's like him hanging out with your favorite indie band, me doing this, me doing that. And I just think it makes you more findable to have a presence, even if your business kind of is a B2B, for lack of a better word, business, which songwriting and production is. If you are on the internet and making some kind of impact and some kind of impression and crafting some kind of identity, it'll allow people Googling around to actually get a feeling if they want to talk more to you. And that could be TI, that could be someone from a country you've never thought you would be doing business. And uh, that kind of thing is happening more and more. And I think being present on social media really helps that. Um, uh, I would also say just make sure you're organic with, with how you represent yourself and like and your brand. People want to see that it's natural and it's, it's really you. And I think someone else said it earlier. It's like you make yourself an experience. You make your life an experience. You make what you're doing something genuine. Then people are going to like listen to your music differently. And it's kind of weird. Like, uh, Cardi B is a great example of that to me, where people love Cardi B as a person before they listen to her music, and then they listen to her music, and then you know it's kind of just like the snowball effect. And if you got to fake it, be really good at it. <laughs> I, just to be thorough, can you repeat the question one more time? Um, I just kinda, why is it important for songwriters and like producers, like indie songwriters and producers, to build their own brand? Right, all right, so that's where I thought, because everyone was talking about artists and you were talking about songwriters and producers. It's, it's a lot more difficult, as some of the guys said here, for songwriters and producers. Um, but um, I think that it kind of goes back to the first question, like the branding. You got to make yourself findable, right? Whatever that takes, like, you know, whether it's an online presence or, you know, networking standpoint. Um, and, and not just like with artists, but like with other songwriters and other producers, right? Because the, the, they're the ones that is going to get the buzz around. They're the ones that are going to, you know, like, you know, Corey will tell you, you know, Corey, I know of him through another songwriter, right? And they were working with all sorts of producers and other writers and so on and so forth. And, you know, when you have, let's say, five songwriters uh, and a producer together, 
it's like anyone gets a call and then, you know, it's like, hey, yeah, we could write something for so-and-so, right? Or so-and-so knows, you know, the manager to this one artist and it's like, all right, well, let's write a song for, you know, that artist and then, you know, we can get it, get it to them from there. So, um, you know, don't discount that either. And, you know, and don't discount the, the you know, being findable. Um, and I'm talking like as if everyone's a songwriter. I don't know, I'm answering your question. But the point is, is that like, they gotta make themselves findable. Um, they, gotta, they gotta put themselves in traffic, you know, and you know, they gotta be in cities and studios and so on and so forth where, where you know, they could run into people where that happens. And then also working with other people you know, I know everyone writes a song and they and they and they think it's the best song or produce a song is the best song and it's like, you know, you, it's not the best, right? And and it can always be better. And the, and the more you work and you the more you develop, you're gonna get better and better and better. You know, I remember, you know, I used to have a publishing company and I had this songwriter sign, and I'm like militant, right? Like I'm really really tough when it comes to songs. Oh, I used to be. Now I'm not as because who knows what works these days. But um, and I was just literally like like just it was boot, it, like being under me was like being in a boot camp, right? And it would be like oh, I mean they used to call me the dream killer. They used to call me the song Nazi. I mean you name it, right? So, but you know he actually spoke to me like maybe a year and a half, two years later, and he was like, "Yo, Sandy, you know." Like, I hate having to go play you a song and deal with it, but he's like, but you know, when I look back and I'm like, six months ago, my songs were nowhere near is what I'm making now. And the six months before that were nowhere near what I was making then, you know, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, and being around people are gonna help you get better and better and better. And uh, so I know I'm saying a lot, but you know, the other thing I see a lot of rappers doing these days is they just Google like type beats, right? It's like the craziest concept to me, right? So they'll just Google it and then that's how they find producers. So like, you know, there's just all these guys that are like just being <laughs> discovered and they're be literally becoming overnight success. I'm dealing with a couple right now, it's ridiculous. And it's like, you know, just because they, they'd set up their YouTube the right way so that someone could find that specific track. And it's, they don't even meet the producer. They don't meet, meet the producer until way after, like I have one right now, it's a hit record, and they haven't even met, and, and, and it's crazy. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, but don't get me wrong, it's a needle in a haystack, right? There's a lot of content out there. It's not like it's one, two, three, but, you know, it, set your stuff up right, you know, and keep pushing and, you know, running DMs and, and, you know, put the right, the right tags on YouTube or whatever these kids are doing and, and, and get it out there. All right, so we can go into a, um, a final question and then I uh, want to be able to let the audience, you know, open up to the audience to ask you guys some questions and, and kind of pull your collective knowledge. Um, what is a great way for any artist to kind of monetize their money more, monetize their, um, their music more quickly? You know, like we understand like how when you get a, a deal and a publishing deal or you go on tour, but what is something that any artist can do to start monetizing their money now while they're building their craft? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, it, is this an assigned artist or a signed writer? Just indie, just like you're, you know, you've built yourself up to a certain level. Like you've, you know, we're assuming that you've gotten yourself to a level that your beats aren't trash anymore, or that your songs have hit a certain level where it's like, you know, they're palatable. You know, what is a, a, a quicker way to, like, you know, in the meantime to monetize, you know, your talent? Right. So, you know, obviously if it's, if it's something that's getting some sort of streaming, um, you know, there's plenty of companies that can help you collect that. Uh, there's distribution channels, um, quite a few that are easily available um, online. Um, so I assume you're meeting some someone that's getting some sort of traction from that standpoint. If they're not, uh, but your you know your stuff is on that level, then you want to start reaching out to publishing companies and um, people like that and try to get some sort of advance from that standpoint. 
Um, not really sure what else. Ask, ask the question again. Well, what is a, a yeah, way yeah, for it? Oh, well, in the meantime? Yeah. Until you pop? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's worse than ever when now it is if you have nothing going on. So don't get your hopes up that you're going to like put it on a distribution platform and it's going to blow up, although that does happen. Like that's the thing. There's a lot of different stories. I'd say get the music off your hard drive, you know, because I think that's the thing I see happening with some artists where it's like literally they're just keeping it to themselves and working on it. You do have to put things out there on a platform, so that's really important. I think finding partners that will treat you fairly and that frankly usually isn't like cash up front because if you don't have something going on already anyone that's going to give you cash is going to take all of your intellectual property like it's more about the split it's more about do they have a good reputation are they connected to people that you admire and that makes sense to you but yeah get it off your hard drive and try to work it with people that are going to work it responsibly and that you can trust I mean, in the interim, before uh, any artist has uh, popped, I found a very, very effective strategy is if you, uh, if you have access to a lot of influencers that you know that, you know, the songs work in a live setting. Maybe they haven't been fully discovered yet, but you got a lot of people that have influenced companies, sponsors that are looking for that next thing. And if you can make a case, and data can be your friend in this case, because if you have any kind of indicators that something is going on, maybe it's not all the way through, but you got something that's going on, they may be willing to hear. Like uh, our most recent uh, event, I actually pitched and successfully got Glenn Fiddick to come on as a sponsor. It went really well, so now we're having continued discussions on being a national sponsor for them. Right now, I'm also talking with Deloitte uh, to see about doing something in the entrepreneurial space where we can actually orient some of the tech platforms that they're doing to bring back a kind of activation or collaboration that will yield some kind of funding that will really support the artists as they go on. And by the way, if you do secure any of these things, these brands are brands that have taken years and decades to build, so that association is not going to be a bad thing, plus you get some money in your pocket. Me personally, I, I totally get that, but then you ask yourself as a, as a new artist, excuse me, as a new songwriter, how do you get to that, that particular stage? That's when you find guys, I personally, I, um, I had an attorney. I had an attorney. Of course, it was word of mouth. It was MySpace. You know, when you put up a song, I used to put up a song. Again, your songs, if you get your songs off your hard drive, that's all the advertisement that you need. So you have different writers and producers, mostly producers, and then sometimes some artists that will reach out and ask, hey, man, I'd love to get in and work with you. You figure out a budget that works for both parties, and you can get in. That's how you can make a living day to day, right? And get your publishing, you know. It doesn't mean anything right now because obviously these artists that are reaching out to you, you don't have a hit record yet. You guys are just building together. But more so, maybe you have something to bring to the table, whether it be engineering, production, songwriting, vocal production. You can charge for it or whatnot. You just figure out what works for you and, and both parties. Um, yes, I would also go for a publishing deal. Um, if that's something that makes sense for you um, in regards to an advance. Um, some guys, you know, you may be able to get like um, someone that, that, that Mike represents, he was able to get like TV and film and you know, you get, you get your song heard into a movie. He never had any like big hit records or anything like that, but that's enough. Whereas in a publisher would take interest, you know, to, you know, offer you a, a sizable advance, you know? So for me at first also, I went after small deals, small publishing deals. I, I signed a deal with Cherry Lane Music Publishing, which was like a, a pitch and place deal. If they pitched it and placed it, they got a percentage of it. You know, and then they'll give you the, they'll give you a mechanical license. Um, the lights, they'll do a, they'll basically pitch your records and they'll try to secure the mechanical license for you um, and the sync license for, um, you know, whether it be whatever is in their channels or whatnot. You can do those kind of things, whereas it's not, it's not, it's not so exclusive. Um, but then you can upstream and do a co-pub deal with a larger publishing company when you do have um, sizable songs that are in the pipeline. You know, if you get a, a, a cut on Nas X or Jay-Z and Beyonce or something like that, you know, you can get a sizable advance that can change your life. So, yeah, but in the meantime, I always say yes. Connect with different people. You never know, because somebody, some, people reach out to me all the time. I come, I do a different events like this, and say, oh man, Corey, I'm looking to do three songs. Right now, I got this little deal going on. It's like, oh, we're gonna do a trilogy. We'll do three songs. Instead of, everyone's doing an EP, but the consumer is very fickle. So give them three songs, let them fall in love with you, and move 
move on. So that's important that you, you know, you try to figure out something that works for you, whereas you can um, showcase your talent and get some money for it in the meantime. Um, it's kind of like going zero to 60, and, and I say that it, it all depends on the vehicle that you have. Um, monetizing your music or your art, uh, there's many variables depending on your degree of art, your networking, your talent, your placement, everything. I would say for like an independent artist, one of the biggest things is, is knowing what you want to do. If shooting it to the labels is what you want to do, you know your end result, try to fill in the blanks. Get the records done. Promote yourself, get your YouTube page, get your website, get your business card, get your t-shirts, your stickers, and fill in the blanks in between. If streaming is your thing, all right, cool. Start getting your, your Instagram marketing straight, get the streaming services on board, work on that. But one of the biggest things I've, I see working with a lot of artists is they're not too sure what they want. They want the success, they want to be heard, but they really don't know what they want. So finding that out and gearing that, you could fill in the blanks a lot more easier once you know the direction you want to go and then you have your vehicle. And also to add a piece, I think uh, you monetize your skills. If you know like your producer, but you also, you're a great engineer, like you're instrumentalist. Like you can get sessions where you just come in and, you know, getting paid as a live musician to play guitar or to sing backgrounds. Like everything doesn't me have to be like, oh, I sing background for Drake. It's just like I sang background for the local lady at my church for a gospel album and she was willing to pay me three hundred dollars. Like monetize those pieces. They have places like where you could things like noise and spice where you can submit your sounds. If you're really like I like I'm a sound nerd, I sit there and spend an hour working on one snare like but you can sell and you can monetize that and one of the things I was able to do is because I taught I was able to like hey I'm a teacher I've done these things you know this how much I charge for vocal arrangement or teaching or a session you know stuff like that so I necess necessarily haven't worked with the biggest people in the world but I was able to find someone like hey we have 5k for this week we need to get this demo done or we need all these guitar parts to be played or piano parts to be played and it was like little things and like I just got married and I was able to go to my wife like hey I just did this thing where I had to work on someone's demo and here's like 3,000 for the wedding like just it everything's not about the biggest person it's about finding about perfecting your craft so that you can find people who have budgets because there's a lot of people that like will just get you on and be like, oh, to be on some rapper's mixtape and there's no money, there's fame to be had from that, but there's no money to be had. But hey, if there's someone, even if you don't think they're the best musician, but they have, they can fit your rate, whether it's $35 an hour for arranging or something like that, or songwriting or, you know, like that, like find those people out. Like it's about the money necessary, not about the clout all the time. Very true. I also just want to say is like reach out to your press, you know, bloggers. We're more than welcome to listen to everyone. Um, websites that get a lot of attention and traffic and, you know, high number of volumes. And you never know who's going to see your music from there. And speaking of mixtapes, I come from that Dat Piff era where Big Sean was like literally a nobody until his mixtape. Um, Detroit blew up and everything like that and same with Mac Miller and stuff so utilize those platforms where you can upload your music and everything like that and I guess it reiterates to our original question of understanding your analytics and understanding your reach and don't be afraid to reach out to different tours and stuff like that even if it's the smallest bar possible tours still make money you can still profit off of that just don't be afraid to do the small stuff um, before you do the big stuff I feel like so we have about like one well, five minutes. I want to open up um, to questions from the audience. So I'm going to set the mic up over here. If you want to walk up in a line, and if you want to ask your question to the panel, we ask that you do that now. Take the wire. Thanks. Give it up for all these beautiful people sharing the knowledge. Hey everybody, I'm Jason. Um, so I work with a lot of independent artists, a lot of rising artists, a lot of newbies, a lot of you know mid-range to unsigned people. And I feel that a lot of people who are just starting their craft like a lot of different types of music. Not Some people know exactly what they like, what they wanna create. But a lot of people that I work with, they're not really sure, they like to dabble in a lot of different things. So my question is, when you're really at that stage and you're trying to find your sound um, before you have a brand, because you might have a brand, you might know who you are, but you might not know the sound that you want to perfect, that you want to drive towards. What 
advice would you give for somebody that's in that position that likes to dabble in a lot of different types of genres and um, maybe hasn't really found the sound, the uniqueness of their brand when it comes to the sound that they want to latch on to? I think personally, um, because I work with a lot of different unsigned rising artists and a lot of times managers come to me and say, oh, we need a country song with a splash of Beyonce and a little bit of Purban, Pop Urban. And we want some island and it's always like this big mix. I think it's important to find a producer. Find a producer that you know is willing to develop that sound with each artist. Because I think that, that will, that'll work out for the artist in the long run. Um, because it can be very expensive. It can be very expensive spending, you know, going and you know, working with a producer and um, you know, using time. So I would find, you know, other than finding a producer, I would say, I always tell every artist, every writer, every producer, there's YouTube so you can learn how to record yourself. You can learn how to at least make a skeleton so that when you do go um, to a producer, you have some sort of, um, you have a lane, you have some sort of, just some sort of, I guess, bone work, just some sort of structure so you know exactly where you wanna go with that particular song. But yeah, to develop and try to figure out which direction you'd like to go in. I think it's really up to a producer and the artist to be in, in sync. I think maybe you don't have to develop a sound, but you should be trying to develop a persona and then kind of create a sound that works with that persona. And I'd point to like, I won't bring up Lil Nas X again, but uh, there's an artist called Father John Misty who's pretty big now. There's an artist called Lana Del Rey, who I'm sure everyone knows. And both of them had essentially failed careers ahead of their careers as the artists that they are now. And Father John Misty kind of came back out as this like LSD tripping singer songwriter from the 70s. Before then, it was before in his earlier career, I think he... Uh, he did stuff under the name Jay Tillman, which since has actually blown up on Spotify since he's become big under the new name. But it was a much more sincere approach to the same material, and it got no traction. Um, Lana Del Rey, I've actually worked with distributors who knew uh, her when she was going out. I think it was Lizzie Wright. Um, and that stuff got no traction, and then she kind of became this like 50s, 60s internet ingenue, and it blew up. You know, So I think part of what people are looking for these days and the way that you are getting people to focus is through a persona. So maybe that's an easier way to think of it, especially if you are a very talented musician who can work in a lot of different modes. Um, think more in terms of how people are going to be absorbing it and how you're going to be presenting it to the world and less about like what you feel like playing this morning. One thing that uh, works with me, I work with a lot of independent artists or artists who are just beginning. And trying to explain genre to them sometimes is confusing. So we do this thing where we call is rooting. We have them record, create, and then we start to categorize the songs that they make and create somewhat of our own genre just so they get an understanding of their mood, their direction. And then we kind of weed it in the direction, oh, that sounds more R&B-ish. It has more of the R&B soul or has more of a pop. So they can get a sense of it because working with a lot of the artists, especially now with how everything's so accessible, it's a lot that they're processing. So we try to make it simple and have them process it slowly, but just create, get it out your system. So that way you could kind of categorize it. And that, that kind of helped a lot with a lot of the artists that we've been working with and developing. No one's here right quite yet, but I have a question. Um, I just really appreciate you guys taking the time. And again, Panalu, thanks again. This, you know, it's, it's really inspiring. Um, but yeah, anyone else that wants to, to ask a question, I, I just want to take the, the moment to, you know, I've been playing drums and guitar since I was little. I've been playing in clubs since I was 14 years old. Like, to me, the music is just the connector of all people and cultures and um, it's just, what I'm trying to relate to is, I mean, I've, I've been busking in the subways. I've been in Brooklyn for nine years. I grew up in Colorado, traveled around. And like the musicians I play with, like we're all playing instruments. And right now, like I lost my studio in February. I have a $500 amount like for storage right now. I carted all this stuff up in an Uber today, just trying to, you know, show the love. But like so much of the music that is on the radio is all in box. There's there's no live drums. There's no guitars. And a lot of these albums you hear, I just saw KT Tunstall in, in uh, Philly. And it was like 
She just had a drummer playing a sequencer, you know, and it's just becoming so hard to justify the cost to bring out a band anymore. And it's just sad because, you know, to me, I just am getting all down to the roots of what's really happening, in, in my opinion, is that we've been conglomerated to the point where, I mean, Live Nation and like all of it, it's just like, how do you make it, you know, sustainable on a level to bring out a band because so much of it is just loop pedals now, you know what I mean? So what I'm curious to ask you guys is what do you think is the, the most wrong with the, the system right now? I'm just curious. One, one, one for me, I'm, I'm just speaking in general for me, one of my biggest grievances with how things are is the love for the art. Um, with, again, how easy it is, I mean, you could buy a $500 setup and have a recording studio. You could go online and just get a B. You could download it without the producer even knowing. Um, and th that's my biggest thing. The love for the art is one of the biggest issues, the respect for it. Um, I don't want to say any names, but I, I go into these meeting at labels um, some of these A and R's, and you'll be you'll be surprised. You know, you wouldn't even be surprised some of the things that are said um, pertaining. To, like, the, like I love this. Like I live and breathe this every day, and the love is diminishing, man. And I think that's one of the biggest things: the respect. And not to single out any genre, but like my, I have a big problem with hip hop per se. Um, we don't respect our, our legends. Uh, they, they're old. They're they're washed up. And we're probably one of the only genres that do that, which minimizes the greatness and the degree of it. So it's just the love, man. Like the passion for it is is become money making. It's become fashion. It's become uh, cool. It's become trending. Um, but the love, man. That's my that's my thing with it. What do you think happened to it though? Like, is it the phones? Is it the media? Oh, you know, who knows? Cool. <laughs> To add a piece to it, I think that there there comes to, like, as someone who plays a bunch of instruments, like, I play piano, I play guitar, I play bass, I play drums. I think there, all, there also is a piece after music school, like, I went, to, uh, I went to school with Corey and stuff like that. I think there is a piece of updating with the time. It's, you know, I think to be successful, like, when I teach my students, just as much as I teach them how to actually play the drums on a drum set, I simultaneously like, hey, this is how you MIDI program your drums. This is how you use a drum pad to do your drums. And I think that we can't get mad that, you know, that the system is changing. Like, I love the digital part of the fact that for my guitar, I just, all I need is a really good guitar with a good pickup because I can just get all the plugins I need. I don't need to pay $5,000 for a stomp board because I can literally just, you know, do it inside of Pro Tools. So I think that there also has to be a piece of you have to be willing to you ha you have to be wi you have to be willing to grow, and I, I think that if you can't evolve with it, that's going to create a problem. Like there's jazz musicians that can play every song and every key, but then have trouble if they have to press record on Logic. And I'm not and I'm not throwing shade because like there are people that I go and learn to because I was like there's things about music that I pr I would never even gleam to know. But I think there's a piece of like, hey, it's like especially like you do engineering, it's a great time to start making sure everything that I can do on like they have this something called like a and it allows you like to play the uh, guitar or harp and this kind of soundboard thing. And it's like, that's maybe a piece of where you need to go because the industry is changing. You know, sell some of those instruments and buy yeah. some of that stuff. Cool. We got to start wrapping up pretty soon. Uh, yeah, last person who wants to uh, I just like to second what you said. Um, I mean, call me call me a, a little bit of a romantic on this industry, but you know, this industry wasn't built exclusively on data. It wasn't. It was built on what you felt, and so th there's got to be at least a portion of this where, at least for me, when I make my decisions in terms of things that go, I have to go at least in part with my gut. I think somewhere along the way we got lost with this data. It got a little too much on hedging on risk. And so I've been to countless meetings with a and I mean, the A&Rs aren't even paying attention to the music. They're, they're texting, they're, they're doing whatever the hell. I mean, like, God, it's crazy. So, I mean, for me, I like to preserve that. I mean, Kiana and I go a little ways back, and she knows that a lot of the salons that I do, with are, they're specifically geared to feature artists and where the whole 
the whole process of that event is just to focus and respect the artistry are ways and attempts to try to focus on that. And so as long as most of us really try to usher that forward, we can demand better and expect better. So I want to know if we can just get a round of applause for our panel. They took a, really a lot of time out of their busy time and their schedules to come and kind of share what they know. So we need about two minutes. We are going to have an intimate performance from Marlena. She's going to go through some of our songs on her new project. 